Welcome to the third part of my second Monarchist Trilogy. In the previous two episodes, we covered the Monarchist movements in East Asia and Southeast Asia. Well, in this episode, we're going to be covering the Indian subcontinent and the Monarchist movements to restore local monarchies there. However, usually we cover these as entire nations restoring a monarch. But that's not how India works. In modern Western thought, we have this tendency to treat India as a single, giant, monolithic entity. I mean, how many times have you heard of people refer to Africa as a country? So it shouldn't be a surprise that the same thing is done to a smaller landmass. Now, normally I would go and cover the backstory of each individual country by country, but since pretty much all of these Marcus movements are kind of interlinked together, I'm just going to give it to you all at once, because that's the easiest way to explain it. So here's something you should know about India. It is, in its entirety, a Western invention. Now what does that mean? I'm not saying this as an attempt at Eurocentrism. The modern day countries of Europe and India would not exist for it not for European imperialism. The country of India is staggeringly vast in terms of population, landmass, cultures, languages, and religions. We tend to think of everyone in a country speaking the same language, but India has a bunch of them, and some of these languages are incomprehensible to others. We also tend to think of Hinduism as a monolithic belief system, but in reality it is a staggeringly diverse religion. It is more appropriate to think of Hinduism as a family of religious beliefs that can be quite different from each other. They don't all worship the same gods, and many of them interpret the nature of their gods very differently. Some do so in ways that seem very familiar to a Western religion, and others do so in ways that a Western mind can't wrap their heads around. These factors are important because what should be understood is that before European imperialism, India was a hodgepodge of differing rival kingdoms and dynasties fighting each other for control of the region just like the Europeans were. Europeans started arriving in India in the 15th century with Portuguese traders. However, things didn't really get going until the British got there in the 18th century. British imperialism in India began with a government chartered company initially called the Governor and Company of Merchants of London Trading with the East Indies, which would eventually just be called the British East India Company. The company was given a monopoly by Queen Elizabeth I for all imported goods from east of the Cape of Good Hope. The company grew throughout the following two centuries, growing to eventually control much of India directly. However, from the very beginning, the company was riddled with corruption. However, because it made the right people enough money, the British were willing to turn a blind eye to it. This would change in 1857 with the Sepoy Rebellion, when a bunch of hired soldiers working for the company mutinied. The company wasn't able to put the rebellion down themselves, and so the British government had to send the military to do it for them. At this point, governance of India was handed over to the British government, and the East India Company would be fully nationalized in 1858. The British government took control of the areas that the company governed directly. However, this left a lot of local dynasties still holding power in their regions. These dynasties were technically independent, but they were all forced to sign treaties of alliance with the British, willingly or by force. These states remained in a legal limbo between being independent and being colonies of the British until 1947, when it was decided that India would be granted independence after a partition that would, in theory, split the country into a mostly Muslim state, Pakistan, and a mostly Hindu state, India. At the time independence was granted, the portions that each country controlled consisted only of portions ruled directly by the British. The law that granted India and Pakistan their independence also gave Indian princely states the right to join India, Pakistan, or to remain independent. All of the states would join one of the two, either willingly or by force. Initially, most of the princes got to keep their titles and have some of their rights recognized by their respective governments. However, these rights would eventually be taken away. India's princes lost theirs due to a constitutional amendment passed in 1971. The princes of Pakistan, however, didn't lose theirs all at once. Individual princes lost their titles and privileges throughout the years for various infractions and political whims. So that was a lot of setup, but if you think we're anywhere near done, I suggest you check the time code and buckle up. Let's start with the princely state of Hyderabad. It was a Hindu majority state, but had a Muslim ruling dynasty, Asaf Shahi. Its last ruling monarch, Mir Osman Ali Khan, didn't want to become part of India due to his Islamic faith, and so he resisted. Ideally, he wanted to become an independent kingdom within the British Commonwealth of Nations, but the British 
British were not interested. He kept negotiations with India going while also engaging in talks with Pakistan. However, due to Hyderabad's geographic location, India couldn't allow it to join Pakistan. So in September of 1948, they invaded Hyderabad in what was called the Operation Polo. The true number of casualties is hard to estimate, but the Indian government's official number is between 30 and 40,000, while other estimates point to at least 200,000 or more and these were mostly Muslim casualties. After the annexation of Hyderabad, Mir Osman Ali Khan was made governor of the state from 1950 until 1956, when the state was split up along linguistic lines. Ali Khan would eventually die in 1967, but not before having just a ridiculous number of kids. Being Muslim and a royal, polygamy was considered normal and expected, so he had numerous wives and consorts. He is reported to have had 149 children, but the one that interests us in this series is his son, Azam Jah. He was born in 1907, and in 1932 he married Princess Daru Shavar, the daughter of the last caliph of the Ottoman Empire, Abdul Masid II. With the princess, he had a son, Mukaramja, Mukaramja, born in 1934. Upon the death of Mir Azman Ali Khan, Azamja was skipped over in the line of succession for his eldest son, Mukaramja, the current head of the House of Asif Shah, and the primary claimant to the throne of Hyderabad. Like his father and grandfather, he was the richest man in India until the 1980s. In the 1990s, most of his ancestral estates were confiscated by the Indian government. However, even after that, he is still worth over a billion dollars today. And nowadays, he spends most of his time in Turkey. South of Hyderabad was the Kingdom of Mysore. Under the rule of Jayakamara Jaya. I'm just gonna call him Jaya. Under the rule of Jaya Wadiar, the Kingdom of Mysore became the first princely state to join India, agreeing to do so on the eve of independence. He became the first governor of the state of Mysore from 1950 to 1956. He would continue to serve as governor of Mysore from 1956 to 1964, after it was reorganized along linguistic lines. His last public office would be serving as the governor of the state of Madras from 1964 to 1966. He would die in 1974 and was succeeded as Raja by his son, uh... Shriek. Aside from serving as head of the family, he also served as a member of India's parliament, as well as becoming a fashion designer and a promoter of the Mysore silk industry. Upon his death in 2013, he didn't have any children. It was customary in Mysore for the widow of the Maharaja to adopt an heir who would succeed her deceased husband. After over a year of consultation with Mysorean nobility, she selected Nara's great nephew, and thank god his name is pronounceable, Yaduvir. In 2016, he married a member of the royal family of Rajasthan, and in December of 2017, they had their first child. But back in southern India, we have the Kingdom of Travancore, and its ruling monarch, Sri Chathira Thurinal, Balarama Varma. He ascended to the throne at the age of 11 in 1924. When India declared independence in 1947, he initially declared independence of Travancore and resisted joining India. But after much pressure, he agreed to join, and like many other former royals, he served as governor of the state until they were reorganized in 1956. He made a name for himself in Travancore by modernizing the country's economy, and especially by removing some of the restrictions that prevented lower caste members from visiting certain temples, which earned him some, you know, brownie points with Mahatma Gandhi. He continued to reign as Maharaja of Travancore until his death in 1991, when he was succeeded by his younger brother, Uthardam Thiranul Marthanda Varma, reigning until 2013, and was succeeded by his nephew, Mulam Thiranul Ramavama. Mulam is the managing director of the spice trading company, Aspinwal. From Travancore, we look west to the Khanate of Kalat, and its last ruler, Ahmed Yar Khan. Before coming to the throne, Ahmed served as a British intelligence agent in the 1920s, reporting on the spread of Russian and Marxist influence within Baluchistan. He hoped that his service would help get Kalat British aid after independence. The UK and India both recognized the independence of Kalat, but Pakistan refused. In April of 1948, Pakistan invaded Kalat and annexed it. Ahmed accepted the annexation and was allowed to keep his titles, but his brothers refused, choosing instead to lead an insurgency against the Pakistani army until 1950. Ahmed was allowed to keep his titles until the province of Kalat was dissolved in 1955. He would briefly declare himself Khan again in June of 1958, but he was arrested during the 1958 coup. He would later be released and had his titles officially restored for a brief time in the 1960s. Upon Ahmed's death in 1979, he would be succeeded as Khan by his son, Mir Dawood Jan. Dawood was succeeded by his son, Suleiman, 
who has been living in exile in London since the death of a Pakistani tribal leader. His word still carries some weight in parts of Pakistan, and some Pakistani politicians have requested him to return so that he can pass by some regions of Pakistan where his word still holds sway. The last state we're going to cover is the Kingdom of Sikkim, and its last ruler, Pal Den Thondup Nagmal. Sikkim was a number of states that were negotiated over between the Indian nationalists and the British government. The policy of the British government was that Indian princely states would have the right to remain independent or join with India or Pakistan. However, the Indian nationalists argued that Sikkim wasn't an Indian princely state, but a Himalayan princely state, and therefore shouldn't be given the freedom to join whoever they wanted. When independence happened in 1947, the status of the Himalayan states was uncertain, but a standstill agreement was signed in February of 1948 that delayed their decisions until later. The independence of India sparked political uprisings in Sikkim, and the creation of an organization, the Sikkim State Congress who, among their many goals, was to be joined into India. The royal government hoped to appease them by appointing some of their members to secretary positions in the government. And on top of that, they also formed their own political organization, the Sikkim National Party. Not satisfied with this offering, the SSC began a campaign of civil disobedience. This became such a problem that Paul then requested military assistance from India, who agreed to send aid in exchange for Sikkim becoming a protectorate, thereby handing over to India all diplomatic, defense, and communication affairs, leaving Sikkim autonomy only over its domestic affairs. In the 1950s, Sikkim established their own constitutional government. However, this would not appease ethnic minorities such as Nepalese and Bhutanese, who in the 60s and 70s began protesting more and more against the government demanding greater representation. The rulers of Sikkim, referred to as Chogyals, had managed to retain their titles and privileges after the constitution was amended in 1971 because they were not a full part of India. Therefore, the Indian constitution did not apply. Resentment was growing within the kingdom of Sikkim by the 1970s, and by 1975, very much of the information becomes hard to verify because there were rumors of anti-Hindu discrimination from the Buddhist Chogyals. In response to these accusations, the Indian government invaded Sikkim and occupied the country with somewhere between 20 and 40,000 troops. To put this into perspective, Sikkim only had a population of 200,000, so they had at least one soldier for every 10 civilians in the kingdom. The Indian army disarmed the Sikkim government and held a referendum, which resulted in over 97% in favor of annexation by India. This number and the large number of troops stationed in Sikkim during the referendum raises a lot of red flags. And this incident has become extremely controversial in India today. For years, India censored anything being published within the country being written about this event and whenever India was criticized, they would try to counter back. China, for example, doesn't recognize Sikkim as part of India to this day. Rather, they recognize it as, an as a sovereign kingdom being, uh, being uh, occupied by India. And Pakistan also does not recognize the uh, annexation of Sikkim. However, under Adira Gandhi, she had the tendency to say, you know, China... That's a lot of big talk coming from someone who, you know, occupied and annexed Tibet and Pakistan. That's pretty tough talk there for someone who stole half of Punjab. So, uh, you know, my name is Pot. Hi, Kettle. Upon the annexation of Sikkim, what first happened was that India amended its constitution giving Sikkim a special status referred to as associate state. But a month later, they amended the constitution again to abolish that previous amendment, thereby making Sikkim a full-fledged normal state within the country, with its monarchy abolished. The last Chogyal, Paldin, would leave Sikkim and in India and eventually make his new home in New York, where he died of cancer in January of 1982. He was succeeded by his son Wang Chuk Nagmyal, who retains the title of Chogyal. However, according to the Hindustan Times, he is something of a spiritual recluse these days, spending most of his time in Nepal and Bhutan, living very much like a Buddhist monk. Now, there are a bunch of other princely states in India, but here's the thing though, there's so many of them and there's so little information available in a language that I can understand that this is where I'm unfortunately gonna have to draw the line for them. There are other stops on the subcontinent we need to make. So we move on from one Himalayan kingdom to another, Nepal, whose empty throne is a rather recent development. Nepal managed to avoid European imperialism through its strict isolationism. And so it managed to remain independent from the British, it 
has remained very economically stagnant. Nepal did get involved in British affairs by means of hiring out their highly trained warriors, the Gurkhas. The Gurkhas would fight alongside British soldiers in the Sepoy Rebellion of 1857 and in both world wars. After the Second World War, a democracy movement sprang up in Nepal calling for constitutional government, and in some cases for the abolishment of the monarchy. When the royal family refused, a rebellion ensued, which resulted in the king, Tripuvan, and his family taking refuge in India in 1950. The Prime Minister was angered at the King and Crown Prince fleeing the country, so he called a meeting of his cabinet and declared the King's four-year-old son, Gayanendra Bir Bikram, to be the new King. India refused to recognize the new regime, and so peace talks commenced, which resulted in an agreement for the King to return and establish a democratic government. Tripuvan died in 1955, at which time his son, Mahendra, was crowned King. He issued a new constitution in 1959, and the following election gave the Socialist Nepali Congress Party a substantial victory. When the king discovered that he couldn't really work with the Nepali Socialists, he decided to suspend the constitution and instead have the country run by a hierarchy of local councils. He would die in 1972 and would then be succeeded by his son, Birendra. Birendra continued to rule through the council system until 1990 when protests and riots broke out around Nepal. He responded by agreeing to a new constitution. This quieted things down initially, but it ultimately failed in preventing the Nepalese civil war from breaking out in 1996, which lasted until 2006. Before the civil war could end, however, tragedy struck the royal family when Crown Prince Dipendra massacred the royal family, killing nine people, including King Birendra and his queen, Ashwaira. Dipendra would shoot himself, but survived long enough to be recognized as king before dying three days later. At that point, King Birendra's brother, who had previously been crowned back in 1950 while his family had fled the country, Gyanendra became king once again. But the massacre did irreparable damage to the royal family, destroying any mythology around it. Between 2001 and 2007, Gyanendra would suspend and reissue the constitution numerous times until 2008 when a coalition of like six or seven different parties got together and passed a resolution to abolish the monarchy. Since then, Gyanendra has expressed in interviews that he doesn't see the interim government's decision to abolish the monarchy as legitimate, but he wanted to stay out of politics in order to let the peace process conclude. He has said that he is willing to return to the throne if asked by parliament. And that does it for this video and the second Monarchist Trilogy. Don't expect another one to come about until sometime in 2019. So if you don't want to miss those videos when they come out, then you need to click the subscribe button as well as clicking the bell icon to turn on notifications so you don't miss a video whenever one comes up. You can also keep track of progress on videos and future projects through looking at our social media posts on Facebook and Twitter. If you're interested in digging into this subject more, I have my sources listed in the description below. I would like to thank my patrons for helping make this video possible. Thanks to your support, Casual Historian can continue to make videos to educate and entertain people on subjects that you're not going to get covered in your history class. If you're interested in becoming a patron and getting perks such as getting to see videos early, as well as getting your name in the end descriptions of videos, then you can go into the description to find our Patreon link or click the link that should be on screen at the end screen. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.